the, uh, this evening to uh, Genesis uh, chapter uh, chapter one. I'm going to start there. We got, we're we're going to jump around here just a little bit in the beginning. I, I don't have any uh, uh, particular preparation for a beginning on this thing. I, I got an idea where we're going. I'm just not sure how to get started and get, get the motor going on it. In uh, Genesis chapter one. There's a, uh, a reference here. We talked about this, I think, briefly uh, before. In verse uh, 28, chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, that's, that's Adam and Eve, and said, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is uh, the fruit of a, uh, is the fruit of the a tree yielding seed. To you shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Uh, in that beginning, there God told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Without going into any great detail, uh, to replenish something means to refill it. And there's an awful lot of King James people that uh, even though they, uh, they are King James to the core, if you can believe that, they come to that word replenish and, uh, and all that means to them is fill because they're not going to allow for any any anything to be, have been in that creation before Adam showed up. Now, whether that's right or whether that's, that's wrong, I am not absolutely certain. But I do know this, unless you change some words in the Bible, you're going to come up with a, with a gap in there uh, that uh, is just the most natural thing that falls into place there, accounting for Satan and his kingdom, not accounting for previous uh, people that God made, not a, accounting for previous a creation of flesh and blood things that God made, not accounting for evolution that God didn't have anything uh, uh, to make and is a fairy tale, but simply accounting that Satan's uh, kingdom was likely there. And in Satan's rebellion, everything dissolved away and uh, stained not only the earth, but the Bible says that even the heavens are not pure in his sight. So there's something that spread throughout the universe that uh, in, that, uh, in that sin and rebellion of, uh, of Lucifer. Now, one of the arguments they, they mention is, is that, well, until uh, Adam came into the world, there was, there was either was no sin or there was no death. Now, that's true, but uh, in, a, in a very real sense, there was no death even before that because the angels couldn't die. They didn't have bodies. They were not mortal beings that, that could do that. They just didn't fall under the same auspices and things that God had for Adam. Now look with me over in uh, Genesis chapter 9. And we'll, I'll put a couple of things in here in the middle as we, as we kind of move along here. Genesis chapter 9 uh, we're not going to skip over the flood or, or Noah. Well, that's, that's what we're going to deal with tonight. But I just wanted to point out something before we even got started. Verse 1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The earth had been judged. There were eight people that came out of that ark. And God tells them, do the same thing that Adam did. Replenish something. Fill it up with people. Fill it up with uh, with uh, living uh, beings that can uh, can uh, worship God, and uh, that's their charge. Uh, I don't know how you get around all that stuff other than just just saying it doesn't exist and and ignore everything that uh, would lead you to believe that. Uh, there are some very serious people that don't believe it, and I I would never make it a point of uh, breaking fellowship. <laughs> Usually, you don't have to. They will. Uh, but I, I don't think it's anything that ought to be fought over. I think it's just something ought to be recognized as something happened there. All right, now, looking at this chart, let's have a word of prayer and we'll, uh, we'll start. Father, thank you today for your goodness. Thank you for a perfect Bible. Thank you, Lord, for, for a perfectly preserved words that mean things. And uh, we ask tonight, God, that you'd help us, help us to sort out these things and see 
what continues in these ages and covenants and dispensations and what might or might not have ended at some point. Lord, it'll help us to uh, in how we need to conduct ourselves, how we understand certain portions and parts of the Bible and how we can be a help to people that have never even con uh, possibly considered these things when we get that, uh, that rare and uh, unusual chance to sit with them and witness a little more deeply than the fact of their need for salvation. Lord, we just ask you now that you bless each one, uh, just minister to the needs of our church family, Lord, both those here and those uh, at home or, or wherever they are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we uh, the first uh, week we went over the Edenic uh, covenant. And in Eden, Adam's given uh, charge over everything and... That's that. Everything is, he's going to be the king over all the earth. And he's, he's the man that is made, created, made, made out of created stuff. I guess maybe you put it that way. Uh, and he's created in the image of God. He's, he's the only one that fits that bill till Jesus Christ shows up with that image and capable, as the, uh, as the songwriter says, uh, stamp thy image. Uh, on our face, put that image back in us in Jesus Christ. Uh, in sin, that image disappeared and it brought a curse. And the Edenic covenant ended. And it ended with uh, a curse on Adam, a curse on Eve. It ended up with a curse on the devil uh, or the serpent. It ended up with a curse on the earth. And it ended up with animals uh, being partakers of that curse and it also changed the disposition of things that uh, after that uh, flesh entered into the diet but also death passed upon all now I guess the first question would, would be when a dispensation ends does everything that's coupled with it end no, not necessarily. Uh, some things are, are, are put in a parenthesis. Some of them uh, might end. And other ones just go on and on and on. Adam was no longer allowed to reach the uh, tree of life. He uh, was put out of the garden. So there's something that ended. And uh, no one was allowed back in there because there was a flaming cherub put there to make sure nobody came back in there. And that thing could have been seen, uh, uh, likely observed by uh, passers by for generations while uh, uh, before the flood. After the flood, the Garden of Eden is gone and uh, just uh, is not available to be seen or anything else anymore. And uh, there are charts and things. If you follow the uh, the uh, timeline of the uh, Bishop Usher who put all of the dates and stuff in a, uh, according to the King James text, uh, that Eden, uh, covenant in Eden might have lasted only about 33 and a half years. When, it, when Adam reached full stature as a man, that might have ended all that stuff there. Uh, and then the Adamic covenant rose along there and uh, would have ended sometime before, uh, long before uh, the Adamic covenant, before 2000 uh, B.C. or Yeah, 2000 B.C. Uh, excuse me, 2000 A.D., when a whole new head of the race is going to take over. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the first one, the Edenic Covenant, that goes on in part. The curse that came out of that goes on. No more Eden, so you can't say the, the uh, covenant with Eden goes along. But we're still here on the earth. That's, that's still here. So we move along to the Adamic covenant. He falls and becomes subject now to, uh, to conscience. And the reason it's conscience is because uh, what else is there beside conscience? Well, you have the spirit of God, but you have, and they'll have law. There is no law in Adam's day. The only law is you can't eat that tree and you can't go back in the garden and better be careful what you do Something will eat you. <laughs> Death passed upon all. So it brings us kind of up uh, to, to the uh, covenant of Noah. And I probably skipped over some things in there. But I wanted to get up to, uh, to Noah tonight and, and kind of start off afresh. Noah would have uh, been from about uh, 
2000 BC, uh, excuse me, uh, from about 2450 BC. And that covenant goes on and on and on. As a matter of fact, all the way through the millennium, much of the, the covenant of Noah is still in effect. And there's some interesting things about Noah's covenant. Uh, number one, the Bible says, let me see if I can find a, a few things in my notes here. Uh, I wrote something down here. Yeah, chapter 7. Chapter 7. Verse 4, it says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the floodwaters was upon the earth. Now, it's kind of interesting that... Uh, uh, Genesis chapter uh, 1 has something to say about that. Yeah, see if I can find it here. Man, I did a horrible job of writing notes on these things. Oh, here it is. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was uh, in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth uh, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So... It looks like, now you, you can say, I think Schofield has a note in there somewhere that uh, it just wasn't revealed yet. Well, there's a lot of that stuff that uh, may or may not be so, but you don't find anything about rain up until you get to Noah's day, and God had that in reserve for something quite unusual that was unknown up until that time, and it might have made the whole judgment seem that much more, as most men would think, a little unbelievable that a man would be building an ark someplace where apparently there's no water around and expecting somehow he was going to call a trailer a company to come move the ark for him down to the river or to the boat launch or something. Uh, God would bring the water to them. So uh, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, also, uh, jumping right to the end, that's when uh, God puts the bow in the sky, chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 uh, and verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you, the Lord says to Noah. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more from the waters of a flood. So there's a promise. God says that the, the Noah's flood dispensation ends with a flood and a promise that he's not going to flood the earth again. Now, that's an interesting promise, but it doesn't tell you that it's not going to be judged again. It's simply that it's not going to be by water again. Maybe he figures twice is enough. That earth, the first earth, was found standing in the water and out of the water, and uh, darkness was over the face of the deep. And somehow or other, God brought out of that the earth that Adam lived on. Verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant. So a token is something that stands for something or identifies something else. Token of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. 
And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. So uh, that ends with that. And in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 4, there's a rainbow around the throne of God that's seen. And the reason I would suspect is it's a, an eternal token. It's an eternal covenant. So it just remains, uh, uh, even in the presence of God, uh, still showing he's not going to do that yet again. But there are some other things in there. And somebody says, well, that was, that was Noah's day, and that's all over. It is, but some of the things in Noah's day go on. That covenant's a perpetual one. Yeah, you see rain, and you still see rainbows today. Look in chapter 9, in uh, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, uh, and upon every fowl of the air, that uh, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. So something before that wasn't afraid of man. Something before that was probably... Uh, uh, everything was relatively docile. Everything ate grass. Everything uh, kind of went along in Adam's day. Adam sinned and something happened. But uh, yet again in Noah's day, something changed. Just like in Christ's day, something is going to change. Those animals are going to go back to, I wouldn't dare bite that child. A, even a serpent not going to bite some kid. He can play with him, put, carry him in his pocket and all that kind of stuff. Not going to bite him. The, the larger animal's not going to hurt him. Just signifying that God can do things that the, the world looks at and says, well, I just don't believe that. You, you can't make all those animals peaceful. No, you can't and I can't, but God can. And he does it just by telling them, don't you dare bite anybody. Don't even think about it. Uh, he goes on here also, verse 3, uh, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. That's a bit different. Even as a, the green herb have I given you uh, all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is in the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. You sh and surely your blood of your lies will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. Uh, every beast that kills somebody was to be killed. And at the hand of uh, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And ye be fruitful, fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So capital punishment is instituted. If you remember, uh, shortly after the Garden of Eden, Lamech comes along and. Uh, people are, uh, uh, Cain killed uh, his brother, Lamech killed somebody, and he's marked, but he's not, he's not killed. And you say, well, why is that? And, well, it's quite simple. Capital punishment had not been instituted yet because it's a government that is not essentially run by man. In the uh, Noah covenant, man now takes the judgment of other men in hand and it goes from the uh, just a uh, man's conscience knowing that he's done wrong and responding to that to a point where God says uh, this is the law for that once that law is established God can is the only one who's going to change his law now in America today uh, capital punishment is almost a uh, archaic relic almost no one is executed today. They, they tend to save that for the worst of the worst of the worst. So I would guess that would be abortionists. They've done a greater job of killing than probably any other group of people on the world. And yet those people are government uh, protected and, and financed. And uh, all you hear is how wonderful they are. And they, well, they provide other things. Well, yeah, that's like saying uh, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer loved his mom. Well, good for him, but it didn't help any of the people that he butchered and ate. Uh, that, that's, uh, you don't argue the law on what you did right. The, the point of law points out what did you do wrong and how are you going to uh, pay for that. <laughs> so at any rate, that goes on and people say, well, well, that was back in those days. 
you know, that eye for an eye. Anybody remember what the Apostle Paul said when they had accused him of all kinds of things? He said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. In other words, you'd be violating God's law not to kill me if I'd done something that I should be killed for. So that still stands in effect. As a matter of fact, in Israel, the land was polluted when, the, when a, a murderer was allowed to be free. That land was not purged from its guilt and from its sin until the death of the, of the killer. That's, uh, that's probably why Joab and some of those other guys were ultimately killed uh, in war. That's one thing, but you kill some, somebody in peace or by subterfuge, or by just laying in wait for them. We get to Deuteronomy, and it lays out some very specific things of how people are to be treated uh, under God's uh, watchful eye and under His specific direction. So all those things are relevant, but they also still uh, keep going on, and we're still under the command to replenish the earth. Children are a heritage of the Lord. They're the fruit of the womb is, a, is an abundant blessing from the Lord. It's amazing how we look at what the devil gives as a blessing now. What God gives is some sort of a curse. We were just talking, uh, Brother Jim was talking about Germany. Uh, the German families have one child, and the Muslims that live there have a dozen. They say, well, how in the world is that going to work out? Well, just wait two generations, and you'll find out how it's going to work out. There won't be any Germans that speak anything but Arabic. It's just a, a, lunatic, a lunatic world that we live in. Uh, let's see here. Uh, back, to, back to Genesis chapter 6, dealing with Noah and what brought all this on here. I, we've, we've gone over this in some other uh, studies here, so we're not going to uh, beat the thing uh, senseless. Just trying to mention what was going on here. Uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. That's interesting, uh, the also. Well, if he's talking about man being flesh, man had been flesh since he made him. What is the also in relationship to? Well, I would take it's the offspring uh, or the, uh, the angels that did this somehow managed to uh, get in a body that could allow them to generate a seed to reproduce the, uh, the giants. Uh, he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, it's interesting that that's about all it says about Noah. In that, Noah is given a charge uh, here in, uh, very shortly to uh, build this ark. And the Bible says simply that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And that for 120 years, in the long suffering of God, he waited. So it tells you several things. Number one, when God saw this, he says, okay, the end is here but I'm going to give you a period of, a, sort of a grace period. I'm going to allow somebody to do something, see if anything happens. But it's kind of interesting about Noah's preaching. He doesn't preach repentance. He doesn't preach an opportunity to turn around. He doesn't preach anything else because this was not a matter of men. This was a matter of something that had no ability to be redeemed because they were not covered by any, uh, any uh, blood that God had made for man. This is something so obscure. When you think about the, uh, the characters today, and there's loads of them, that uh, they are so unbe unbelieving of the Bible, they think that uh, the, the uh, sons of God were the uh, Sethites, and the, uh, the sons of the devil or the, these other uh, group here, the sons of Cain or, or some other uh, bunch there. And they, they come up with this kind of stuff. Yeah, but... Uh, Everybody could repent if you were a man. But God doesn't ever get, offer salvation to the angels, any of them. God doesn't offer salvation to the devils, any of them. God doesn't offer salvation to the spirits, any of them. It's offered to man. So I, I think at, at every angle that you look, uh, what you find in there is people that just don't believe enough Bible to be listened to. 
uh, more than about five minutes. I mean, they may be right on an awful lot of things, but if somebody's wrong on something is, uh, to me, as obvious as that and as flagrant as that, they're not taking the Bible serious. They're taking their, their school teachers serious, and uh, they ought to just turn all that around. So anyway, for this 120 years, Noah's preaching righteousness, and uh, apparently nobody listened. He doesn't have one convert. You don't even read that his family are actually converted, simply that their, their generations are right. They're not polluted by this business. And that's the cause that God says of all of this stuff here. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which are of old, men of renown. Uh, Alexander Hislop, in his book, The Two Babylons, uh, relates the, uh, some of these things, and some of them are attributed to uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth as these uh, these heroic figures of the past and of the uh, legends and and uh, that type of stuff. And some of them are attributed to these fallen angels and their seed who came along. They were uh, demigods, as, as they were called. They were supernatural in their their composition, but they could die like men They're, when their body died. And there's something about all that that's rather telling that those angels wanted to be in bodies so that they could enjoy the sensual pleasures that a human being could because that had been denied them because they didn't have a physical body to live in. They had a spiritual body and they could show that when they wanted to. And somebody says, well, how did that happen? Now you're going to have to go to... Uh, the Lord and figure if you find that answer out, let me know. I'd be kind of curious. Not that it would help you out in anything, but it would be interesting. So anyway, they became the uh, men of old, men of renown. So all of the mythological, legendary gods uh, were these people uh, throughout the world. We, we talked about this in Ezekiel studies and some other things. As these people spread out after the Tower of Babel, the the principal leaders of these people were always chosen, just like Saul was. They were tall, they were big, just like Goliath was. They were war warlike and seemed capable of defeating any human being or any other person. So they became the tribal chiefs, the leaders, the, the shamans, the witch doctors, all that kind of stuff, uh, because they had supernatural knowledge. In chapter 4, we didn't, we didn't study it, but in there, almost every talent that men have for developing the comfort, what we would consider the comforts of life. Look back with me there for just a minute. Chapter 4 and verse, uh, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. There's the first city. Uh, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begat Mahul, and Mahul begat Methusel, and Methusel begat Lamech, and Lamech took him two wives. There's polygamy starting. And the name of uh, one was uh, Ada, and the name of the other one was Zillah. Uh, he got him A to Z. Uh, and Ada bare Jabel. He was the father of such as dwell in tents and such as have cattle. So there's sort of animal husbandry starting out and a transient population that travels. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the, name, uh, he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. Did you ever hear people, well, I just wasn't born with any musical talent? Apparently these people were. And uh, their families produced those types of people. They were specialists and uh, began doing all these things. Verse 22, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer of brass and iron. And uh, sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So there's uh, the, the first farmers, husbandmen, musicians, metal, uh, metal workers, uh, all of these people, you know what? They're all on the wrong side of the, the tracks, aren't they? 
Well, where were all of the people that were doing that? I guess they were still taking care of sheep. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam, uh, anyway, why wasn't he killed? Well, because the, the law about killing a person was not set in effect. It's an interesting uh, thing to understand. Uh, and let me ask you this question. The average lost man, the average church attender that doesn't know any Bible, they look at it, they think evolution has to be the answer because after all, where did Cain get his wife? And the answer to that is obvious and simple. He got, him from his, got her from his father-in-law. Right? Well, they were cousins. Or he married a sister. So they say, well, it's against the law to marry your sister. It is now. Was it then? No, you know, it's not against the law. This intermarrying is not against the law. But if they don't believe the Bible, what difference does that make? If you don't believe the Bible, you have no law. You just have whatever you feel like doing uh, for the time being. Uh, but... Uh, it doesn't come up till uh, Moses' day, which is long after this. So in the meantime, uh, you find these things uh, popping up. And the logical reason, now the Bible doesn't say this, but I would say possibly uh, and likely the, the logical reason is, when you uh, interbreed dogs, cattle, almost any kind of uh, living thing, you're not adding anything to that animal. You're just, you tend to be breeding out of it, more selective breeding. You take uh, dogs, I think there's only like maybe two or three kinds of dogs. There's two or three kinds of cats. There's maybe two or three kinds of cattle. And as you cross breed those things among the same kind, you can add other varieties of that. But if you just kept one of them, you don't allow any other genetic material in there. And in human beings, it begins to, as the gene pool uh, breaks down, you end up with genetic defects and you end up with the, uh, you know, the little kid on the porch playing the banjo and uh, in deliverance. And after a while, uh, it just it just destroys everything. A lot of uh, nations, their kings and uh, the lines of their nobles were so inbred that they were just not even capable of producing anybody with, a, with any brain power at all, and those kingdoms fell. They, they destroyed themselves by that. So I suspect that up until Noah, uh, excuse me, Moses' day, everything went along, and uh, finally God says, okay, we're getting so far from, uh, from a healthy level of stuff, let's, let's put an end to that, and let that be the example worldwide. You gotta remember when God gave that to, to Moses, he gave it to him uh, under the guise of this is what God wants. So it's a worldwide uh, recommendation. But anyway, verse, verse 5 here. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So God thought about this changed his mind. He says, I've got to come up with a plan to respond to this. That's what repentance is. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Violence created that demand of judgment Noah was out of the entire earth, was the only, uh, the only man left, and apparently his family, that had not been uh, physically involved in the contamination of these, these uh, angelic beings and their offspring, and God allowed them to live. That's why there was no message of repentance. Uh, you know, we often uh, hear people preach, and, uh, and, and nobody came into the ark. God didn't invite anybody into the ark. You don't read anything about Noah inviting anybody into the ark. That ark was for 
what God wanted in there, and everybody else was to stay out. So Noah begins the, the dispensation and the covenant with Noah of a human government that's instituted for the protection of the, uh, the human race and for the protection of, uh, of life. And the curse is put on there that if you kill someone, you have to die. If an animal kills someone, it must die. It can't be tolerated that they would be killing things that uh, are taken care of, uh, uh, that are set forth by God. All right. Anybody got any questions? Anybody got any answers? We, I just kind of rambled and skipped around on that thing. I know we've got a lot of ground covered. Yes. The first time I ever heard that God didn't want anybody else but Noah. There's no invitation ever given. And, and yeah. No invitation. Yeah, well, that's... Right along with, you know, Jesus invites you to get saved. Yeah. And uh, we actually went to a musical one time, and at the end, it was about Noah's Ark. Yeah. And the door opened, and they, you know... Yeah. What was the preaching for? <clears throat> you preach. Judgment. Just judgment. It's kind of like that, uh, the angel that preaches during the tribulation period. You don't give an invitation. There ain't no mercy in that. Just judgment's coming. <laughs> Not by flood, but by fire. When you look at these things, that uh, maybe we've we've reached the the object, I guess you will, of covenants and dispensations. God had already decided all this flesh was gone. It was contaminated. It perverted its way. And he says, I don't want them in there. So there is no, it, it isn't a matter of us reaching out with our heart and reaching out. That's the natural sympathy. God says, I don't want them in there. You bring one of them in there, you got the same thing two, uh, 370 days later you just had. You're going to carry that over into the next world? He said, nope, don't want that. When you uh, you got to read the Bible uh, for what it says. Now you know the old thing uh, between read, reading between the lines. I, I mean I understand that, and it, I just did that on the conclusion of why God told Noah, uh, told uh, Moses, uh, don't marry your sisters or don't marry a, a cousin or whatever. But you be careful when you do that because don't try and put into God's mouth what He doesn't say. It makes it clear that there's a time coming when those that are in are in and the door closes and nobody else gets in. That's the, the lesson of Noah is you better keep yourself right with God while you can because one of these days that door is going to close. Like, consider this, Noah and his family were in there for a week. They're just sitting there wondering what's, gonna, what's going on here? How come we're not gone? How come this isn't over yet? I don't think he had any idea that it was going to last for a whole year. Maybe he did. Who knows? Anyway, so interesting observation. Uh, we're coming up on a time when that rapture, uh, at the rapture, there's no more invitation. Who wants to be the last to go? We're going to sing five more verses of Just As I Am. You better get in while you can. It's just gone. And then a strong delusion. Boy, I tell you what, God didn't need a strong delusion in Noah's day. He had a, had a flood that uh, nobody could swim through. All right, so uh, Noah, uh, the Noah covenant on most of those things, right, frankly, everything that we read about, started about 2450 B.C. And when does that run? Runs all the way through the millennium. Everything in there. Those animals are changed, so they're not going to do that. Men, man, you kill somebody, you're, you're accountable for it. You're going to die, sure as, uh, sure as anything goes. Uh, capital punishment, replenishing the earth. Uh, even uh, at the end of the millennium, there's uh, just population grows and just looks like it goes right on down the line. Uh, let me... Look here real quick. I guess we got, uh, we covered enough there to, to get the idea. 
One interesting thing about Noah is there's not much of a question mark of when, <laughs> when that happened. Some of them, they're, they're just kind of flow into one another. When we get to the New Testament, the New Covenant, uh, and I want to draw a distinction between the two, we would think of uh, the New Testament, the average professing Christian that reads the Bible, to him, the New Testament starts in, in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And yet, that new the possibility of the New Testament doesn't begin until Matthew 27, 51, or 27, 50, 51, when Christ's uh, blood is shed on the cross. So what do you do with 27 chapters of those things? Well, you, you've got to realize that you're in a, a sort of a flux where we're shifting from one thing into another. And if you don't, if you're not mindful of that, you're trying to get saved by enduring to the end. You're trying to get to heaven by being a peacemaker or being meek or turning the other cheek or doing to others as they would have, uh, it would have others do unto you. And you miss the whole point of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That was the atonement. It wasn't to make you better so that you could uh, be nicer and get to heaven by your good behavior. It was so that you could be cleansed and all those other things were to show that something has shifted and radically changed and it will never, uh, never quite go back to the way that it was. All right. Everybody, uh, everybody okay with that? Any, any questions? All right. We'll uh, launch off here just a little bit more. Let me, uh, let me mention something here that is never given as a dispensation, but it's uh, while we're in the, uh, in the neighborhood, we'll look at it. Genesis chapter 10. Uh, Genesis chapter 10 is, is right between Noah and the Tower of Babel, so it doesn't get a lot of press. <laughs> There's exciting things, interesting things, big things on both sides. But Genesis chapter 10 lays out the, uh, the uh, cast of characters that will be around when the, when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up again to take his throne. And all of these descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth are developed into nations at this point. Of, the, of these three people was the whole earth overspread. And it says something interesting uh, down here in verse uh, uh, 25, chapter 10, verse 25. And also unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Uh, it's kind of interesting. In verse 32, it says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. If you've ever looked at a, a map that uh, evolutionists use, and you kind of turn that thing back, you realize they, they believe the whole earth at one time was just one big land mass. Pangea, uh, I think there's a couple other names they, they put on it. but uh, That's probably true. The difference being that it didn't take millennia, it didn't take eons, it didn't take ages for this to happen. It probably was kind of the thing where God said, all right, everybody... Uh, uh, Take your seats, put your trays and tables in an upright position, buckle your seat belts. We're about to we're about to shift this continental business into high gear. And within the lifetime of that man, God moved these continents apart. That's why they have uh, the flood stories in every uh, every culture, every continent, every place that you go. Uh, you look down at the the uh, South Pole. Uh, they they have uh, in Arct Antarctica. That's a, actually a gigantic land mass that's covered with miles of ice. And as they look down through that stuff, they found tree stumps. They found all kinds of interesting things in that. And just now beginning to have the technology that is able to kind of peer through that much ice and that much water and stuff. And uh, down underneath all that are actual lakes of, uh, of uh, non-frozen water. They have uh, the Perry Reese map. Everybody ever hear of that? Anybody ever hear of it? 
it's, it's considered to be one of the earliest maps, but it shows uh, the Antarctic continent with no ice on it. It shows the, the land masses, the land geography of it, that has only, within probably the last 10 years, been really uh, fairly well identified. And this map is from the 1500s. So you look at those things, you wonder, well, how in the world did they know what that looked like under three miles of ice? Well, that map is undoubtedly from earlier maps. And those maps are probably from earlier maps than that. And somebody just, since they had probably hadn't been there, said, well, let's just look at these maps and put, piece them all together, and that's what it looks like. And even the mountain ranges they had drawn on there are correct. So it's kind of interesting, the knowledge that was available to people uh, 2,000 years ago that has been missing for the last 1,500 years or has been so obscured by what we can't know or don't know. Uh, some of the most dangerous uh, waters for shipping is, uh, is in the, uh, the Antarctic. The Arctic is pretty well... Uh, Okay, the, the Antarctic has some of the fiercest winds and waves and currents and things uh, on the planet. But at one time, it had trees growing there. And in the days of Joktan was the earth divided. In Deuteronomy uh, 32, we'll go over, I think we looked at it uh, at one time before, but it gives the, uh, Bible says the earth was divided according to the 12, uh, 12 tribes of Israel. There are literally 12 geographical land masses in the world, as there are 12 uh, astrological masses in the heavens that are identified by constellations, uh, according to the 12 tribes. And there were 12 stones on there that relate to both of those things, both Israel and the, the, the heavens uh, that were used to identify certain things. It's an interesting book to say the least. And uh, if anybody ever figured out much of these things, it would be, uh, be quite a deal. All right. Uh, look over Genesis chapter 12. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12. God spoke to Abraham and told him to get out of the land where he was. And he says in uh, chapter 12, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee uh, of a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them, plural, that bless thee, and curse him, that's singular, I guess, that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Some, some people get a late start in that Bible. If you're living to be 175, I guess that's, you're approaching middle age at that situation. Uh, but I don't know today that's going to work out real well. Uh, and Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. That's, uh, you can almost hear the music in the background. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land of the place of Shechem, uh, Shechem, unto the uh, plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. And he, and he removed this into a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. As you read along there, later on God makes a covenant with Abraham while Abraham's sleeping. So uh, how respondent do you have to be when God makes a covenant with you in your sleep, he just gave it to him without regard. He says, I know who you are. I know what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do with you and with your family. So the, uh, the Abrahamic covenant becomes the covenant of promise. So we've been through uh, the Edenic covenant was innocence. 
Then it uh, was a fallen man and it fell to conscience in Genesis chapter 3. In Noah, it comes under a, the human government agency where men are to rule over other men. I didn't read all that stuff, but as you read there, you realize that God put men under other men and it was a uh, not just go kill somebody because they killed somebody, but go kill them uh, in an organized fashion. And as time goes on, those things are developed more fully nation by nation until you finally get to Israel. And it, uh, it probably is not impressive to most people today, but if you'd lived in a day when uh, somebody could kill you uh, sort of willy-nilly, you'd realize what nation is there so great or so nigh to God that has God's laws revealed to them of how they should conduct themselves. So uh, he calls on the Lord, and Abraham is given these promises. Uh, chapter, uh, uh, let's see here, chapter 15. Says something interesting here. Verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Uh, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? Uh, let's see here. And Abram said, Behold, to me uh, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And lo, and behold, excuse me, and behold, the word of the Lord came in him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. There wasn't going to be uh, Ishmael, uh, no way. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Uh, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to, to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. He didn't do anything to become righteous. So Abraham becomes the pattern of a man receiving a promise from the Lord. And by believing that promise, he is, becomes one of Abraham's seed. He did not become a Jew. He became Abraham's seed. There are no Jews at this point. God hasn't developed uh, 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 Jacob yet, or the, the whole family line up to Jacob yet. So it's just... A promise. We're believing what God said, and we accept that. We're still living under that day. The promises of God are all yea and amen in Him. We still live by the promises. We uh, serve God under His promises. We have expectations that, that are there, uh, requirements that are there, but uh, it's the promise that opens all of those doors. And uh, here's how this thing is confirmed. Uh, verse... Eight. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? <laughs> that's, that's my kind of faith. <laughs> yeah, Lord, I believe that. How am I going to know that? Well, isn't that what we say to God? Well, I think I'm saved. I feel saved. And God says, I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in you. He's going to bear witness with you that you're saved. Now, Abraham had a little bit of different thing here, but it goes on. Verse 9, he said to him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness uh, fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kizanites, 
Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphiams and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites. Lots of sites there. Abraham is in, in sleep and God confirms that promise to him in his sleep. And uh, you know what it shows you? God's promises are there. You don't have to have a physical response, but it's belief. And God will work out the rest one way or another. It's not always the same how he uh, manifests his responses, but to Abraham, he did that. So this, uh, this thing goes on. Abraham kind of catches God. And he, uh, later on, he says, uh, well, uh, my seed, right? Yep. He says, oh, that Ishmael would live in thy sight. He says, yeah, but he won't. <laughs> he says, well, how about giving him something? And he made him 12 tribes. Isn't it interesting that that opposition to God is always sort of an equal proportion physically, but it has no future. It can't go anywhere. When the world thinks, well, we're as big as God, we're as strong as God, God says, you just got the physical side. You don't know what you're up against here. You can't win. You can't go there. And uh, uh, chapter 17, he makes uh, this, this statement. Again, each one of these times, it's sort of amplified and, and broadened a little bit. Now, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Well, he's kind of re repeating what he said there. Neither shall thy name uh, any more be called Abram, but the name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruit, fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said unto Abram, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt you and me. And then he gives him the, the circumstances in verse 13. He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So uh, tell me something. How is it that you're going to give that promised land to the Palestinians? Anybody think that's ever going to work? You know, people can talk about President Trump in any way that they choose. He's the first president. Even Jimmy Carter, you know, uh, a professing uh, Christian. I think that's probably about as far as it went. Uh, but anyway, a professing Christian, he never made overtures like that. He never made moves like that. You think a man get in there and have that kind of authority over the earth, he'd say, uh, throw all them bums out of Israel. Give it back to those people. Now it's Israel, so they could do what they wanted. But uh, President Trump did it. I don't know whether he believes those promises or not. I have no, no idea and no insight whether he does. But he certainly does, did something to fulfill promises and uh, recognize that land was theirs and recognizes that the history of the world is intrinsically tied up in their, their treatment of the Jews. Now, whether that goes back to Presbyterian upbringing or whatever, I don't have any idea whether somebody got a hold of his ear and told him that, whether he dreamed that up on his own, I don't have any idea. All you got to know is, is that when, you, when a man's ways please the Lord, God makes even their enemies to be at peace with them. And uh, for the, you'd think they've got peace treaties with most of the countries in the Middle East after all these years of war. And, and it ain't in the news at all. 
you, you got to look to find any of that stuff. I don't know whether the devil just wants to keep all that quiet or not. All I know is God made this a long-term covenant. Look down here in verse, uh, verse 18 of that same chapter, chapter 17. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the prayer of every father for their children, a father that wants their children to be blessed and do right. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, well, <laughs> I've heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee, at, the, at uh, this set time in the next year. You realize that those Arabs have been sitting out a sand pile full of oil for all these years. They have been blessed. God has made a way for them. But he says, that's it. Material things, it's all they've got. So you look at uh, Ishmael today, you know what he's concerned with? Material things. That spiritual stuff, you take away the material stuff out of it, there's no religion there at all. It's all based on what can I get? What can I take? How much can I accumulate? Of course, a lot of, a lot of Baptists ain't far from that. Uh, but anyway, so the Abrahamic covenant is based on God's promises to Abraham. Abraham was made righteous by his faith. He was made just by his obedience. And there's a, there's a level of that that to save people today ought to, to reconcile. You get the promise of God for everlasting life, the promise of God of the forgiveness of sins by belief. But your rewards yet to come come by obedience. You, you're justified before the world. The book of James uh, describes it if a uh, man says that he's said by uh, that he's uh, okay by faith. Well, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. And one is simply illustrating the reality of the other. Today it's been taken to the extremes of, well, you don't have to do works. You just believe that and everything's wonderful. Well, it is for salvation. The other side of that coin is, is if you believe that, where are the works that are certain to follow real faith? Well, Abraham had his. He had his failures. He had his uh, backsliding days. He did things that everybody looked, well, if you had the faith of Abraham, yeah, give your wife to, to an enemy to save your own skin. Man, you, you know, one thing that uh, the Bible doesn't, doesn't equivocate on is all flesh is grass. The best man God ever had was a man until Jesus Christ came along. David was a, was a mighty man and a man after God's own heart, but you wouldn't want to leave him home while you're on a, next to your family while you're on a deployment. That might not work out real well. God says, yeah, that's, that's flesh for you. That's flesh for you. So we end up on the first, second, third uh, covenant with Noah, moving into <laughs> just a promise. Each one of these ends in... Uh, in, uh, in some level of, of failure or at least a pause. God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you that land. He had to wait 400 years to get it at all. Then they lost it when they went to Babylon. They lost it to the Assyrians. They're going to get it back, but it's not going to be till the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And Abraham's seed are going to inherit that land. The, the, this stuff is really tough for, for a non-Bible believer to follow because they look at it like reading a book. Okay, that chapter is ended. Let's move to the next chapter. God doesn't do it like that. God overlaps these things, merges these things, blends them together at times, sometimes just cuts them off as sharp as, uh, as you could with an ax. By the time uh, Paul shows up in the, in the, in the New Testament, do you think you're going you're gonna to keep the law and offer sacrifices and go to Abraham's bosom? You're, you're just dead wrong and dead in, in hell. It ain't going to work for you. 
you got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The train on that stuff pulled out. And if you're not in it, you missed it. All of the uh, Reformation churches trying to, trying to get you to do something or something they can do to you, baptize you to get you into heaven, boy, have they missed the boat. They missed that altogether. All right, anybody got anything they want to add? I mean, we, we've given a, just the briefest of, of kind of uh, outlines on these things. And I hope it's uh, at least something interesting has is, is, uh, come across your bow tonight that will help you in some of these things. Uh, by the way, the Abraham Coven Abrahamic Covenant starts about 2000 B.C. and runs right through the millennium. And that new heaven and new earth, I guess, is probably still going to be Jews. They're still going to be serving that because they were given perpetual uh, statutes and perpetual blessings to be with God. All right. Nobody else? All right. Let's stand. Pray for Brother uh, Sebastian. He's going to be preaching for us next Sunday morning. So uh, I get to, get to hear something interesting. Give him plenty of heads up this time so we don't have to be working on it while he's up here. I don't want him to use up family time working on another message. Amen. Anybody got a song that's uh, running through their head?